In the prior sections, you learned how to create a single neuron to solve the problem of linear regression to predict some output value given some input values. In all the prior examples you saw, even those with multiple inputs, at their essence, they're able to predict linear data, that is, to predict data that can be approximated with a straight line, through multiple dimensions if needed. This is great, but not all data in the world will have a linear correlation. What if you had some input data that was not linear, like the graph data shown here, that's exponential in nature? How can you use neurons to approximate that? In this example data, you multiply the input value with itself to get the output value, leading to the output numbers growing in size very fast and exponential growth. A single line is just not going to be able to break down the curve well enough to approximate it as shown. Let's check these assumptions by updating your previous code written with this new data to see how it handles it. In this example, you'll reuse what you created in the last session as your starting point. Alternatively, you can make a copy of my full working version shown here that contains the code from the prior section if you don't have it available. Use the URL at the bottom to get it and then fork a new copy of that project, which you'll use in this section as shown. Once you've got a copy, go ahead and open script.js, which you'll be editing in this session. Now, the top of script.js will currently look like what you see here. Right now, it imports the real estate training data. You can go ahead and delete that line as you'll generate new training data for this nonlinear data example. Great. Next, it's time to define some new inputs. Replace the current inputs with this code instead. Here, you'll use a loop to generate the numbers from 1 to 20 as your input value array. In a similar fashion, you can do the same for the output values. Here, you loop through all the inputs created and multiply each input number with itself to produce the desired output value. Essentially, you're squaring the number. Next, you can update the tensor creation of the inputs to be a tensor 1D instead of a tensor 2D, as your inputs are now one-dimensional. Great! You now have training data that you can use. All you need to do now is update your model architecture to expect a single input instead of two that you had when predicting house data. Scroll down to the part of the code that defines the model. Here you can see it currently expects an input shape of two values. Update this code to match the new input shape, which is of size one instead. Finally, scroll down to your evaluate function. Here you need to update the value you use to ensure it's of the correct new shape. Update it to predict a value for the number seven, for which you hope to see the number 49 as the answer. If you check the console at this point, you'll see something similar to the following. Given that our output numbers are all in a fairly small range, 20 times 20 after all is 400, which is our largest output number to predict, a loss of 120 is pretty terrible. And the validation loss is even worse at 332. So what can we do at this point? Well, to give the single neuron a fair shot, it would be wise to update the training parameters like batch size and epochs to ensure that these are the most sensible values for the smaller amount of input data that we have in this example. So find your train function and look for the parameters you set for training. First, as you only have 20 input values, it's not wise to use a validation split here as you want every input to count towards the training. So remove the validation split option. Next, change the batch size to two as you don't have much example data to sample. You can also change the epochs to 200 to give it a chance to learn from this very small amount of training data. Finally, remove the second console.log for validation error loss as it will no longer exist as you remove the validation split above. Now, when you rerun the code, it will take much longer to run as you're going through the data 200 times, so be patient for the result to come back in the console. You can see here though, that the loss is better than before, but it's still less than ideal. It's clear a single linear neuron is struggling. Here you can see the loss is around 30. And if you try to predict the value of seven as an input, it predicts 84.3 instead of the expected 49. How can you do better? One thing to note at this point is that for longer running training like this, it's sometimes useful to monitor the loss at the end of every epoch to ensure it's indeed going down over time. Checking for TensorFlow.js website documentation shown here, it seems there's some code to do so. So let's update your code to use that.
Going back to your train function and finding the part where you fit the model, you can add an extra property called callbacks and specify an object containing callback functions to use for key events. One such event is called on the epoch end, to which you can specify a function to call every time an epoch ends to log important information that it has. Here, you'll create a function called log progress to do that. All you need to do now is to create the callback function you specified. You can add this new log progress function to the end of your script.js file for now. As you can see, it will be passed two parameters, the current epoch number and the logs it has about training. In this instance, the logs object will just contain a loss value. Here you can simply print out the data contained in the logs using console.log. Remember, the loss passed here is the mean squared error loss. So if you want to see the error in terms of the original input data, you'll need to square root these numbers as shown here. Now you'll see the loss after every epoch. If you look at the animation of my losses on this slide, you'll actually notice that it hits a loss of around 30 pretty fast, around epoch 70. After that, it just bounces around the values, meaning with the current learning rate, it can't really get any better. You could try lowering the learning rate when epoch 70 is reached in this case to see if that helps with learning. To do that, go back to your train function and go to the line where you specified an optimizer within model.compile as shown. Create a new line of code that defines the optimizer you'll use in model.compile. Here, you just took the value that was previously in the model compiles optimizer property and made it a constant called optimizer instead. Next, update the model.compiles optimizer definition to be the constant you have now created above instead as well. You can now cut the two constants you have at the top of the train function so they can be placed in the global scope for other functions to see and use. Paste these two constants you just cut right after you finish building the model architecture and just before you call the train function. These constants will now be in the global scope of the program for any other function to see. Finally, you can update your log progress function to detect when epoch 70 is reached and set a new learning rate for the optimizer that's currently being used. Now that the optimizer constant is accessible, you can call set learning rate on it and pass a new learning rate to use. Here, you just divide the current learning rate by two and see how that fares. Checking the new output, this does allow it to go down slightly more to 29, but it seems to reach the capacity of what this neuron is able to achieve as it very quickly starts to bounce around 29.7 instead. At this point, it's probably safe to reduce the number of epochs to 80 as no further learning is happening after this point. So now the question becomes, how can you do better at this loss? Head on to the next part of this section to find out.